Try the zombie takeout. It's not bad. Yeah. Oh, well. Hello and welcome to episode 427 of Zombie Takeout. Zombie Takeout. The B-Movie and Cult Movie Show. I'm John. Hello, I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's movie, we've got a voicemail from Bodo in reference to well, one of last week's movies, Blood for Dracula. Hey, I sent you a tweet about this. I don't know if you saw it or not, but in the movie Blood for Dracula... The scene where the farm hand is killing Dracula, cuts off a couple of the limbs, and Dracula goes, you can't hurt me. Now, this came out the year before Monty Python and the Holy Grail. So that's the reason why I gave it a half a brain, because I thought maybe Monty Python and the Holy Grail stole that for the Black Knights versus King Arthur scene where he shouts, it's only a flesh wound. So you guys are the best. Bye. Thank you, Bodo. That is a great Always observation. Good from you. Oh, that we're the best. <laughs> no, that is a great observation about the Grail being a, a year after Blood for Dracula. I mean, I'm not going to yeah. say that it was an influence. I don't think it ripped it off. I think it's too <laughs> close to have been a rip off. But it's just fast because they are very similar scenes. It's it's fascinating that this came for that Blood for Dracula was first. Now, if Frank Baron Frankenstein had raped the nostrils instead of the gallbladder, mm-hmm. then I, I'd be right there with him. Yeah, but yeah. Alas. Bravely brave Sir Robin. <laughs> <laughs> and without any further ado, on to this week's movie, which is from 1981 Outland. This is our Sean Connery tribute. He passed away over the weekend. Um, of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by Stimulants. They're not the only way to hallucinate, but they may just be the most lethal. And also brought to you by 70s Computers. Come for the weird F key interface. Stay for the rando graphic output. All right. So we have a new marshal in these here parts <laughs> of uh, Io, the moon off mm-hmm. of Jupiter. Yeah. Uh, it's um, it's funny to watch this right after season one episode or season two episode one of the Mandalorian, oh, which yeah. is pretty much. I mean, tumbleweed blowing by, you know. We need to discuss. You've since you've seen it. We need to discuss the ending after we record. Of course, <laughs> I, I knew we were going to do that. But anyway, uh, so it is uh, just your basic mining colony, you know, uh, or mining town. Only it just happens to be in space, so it's a colony. Uh, but however, something is uh, is wrong here. Um, they they have a few people just going crazy and and killing themselves uh one of them i think winds up becoming a mailman in boston and frequenting a bar after this i didn't catch that until i saw it in the credits (laughs) (laughs) did not recognize it at all i was a mind of a dio (laughs) did you recognize him or did you catch it in the credits no i totally did not recognize him and it was pointed out that uh francis sternhagen played his mom on cheers oh so that's where i know they, her from okay <laughs> they both like went right from this to doing cheer or she i think came in like a few yeah, seasons yeah. later but i knew it. i mean i'm sure i've seen her in a billion other things but there was something particular i knew her from it was cheers yeah i've seen her in a bunch of tv things she's yeah, yeah. always I, this is probably the youngest i've ever seen her mm-hmm. though even though she has like a career that goes decades before it but anyway right. uh so we have a new marshal in town uh his he's settling his family in uh his wife is mysteriously overly affectionate i thought i mean well that's a weird acting choice <laughs> except um it was uh, she was running off on him, <laughs> not telling him after only being there for two weeks. Uh, the other part is, of course, the um, the uh, Frankenstein's creature is uh, the general manager of this mining colony mm-hmm. from the corporation, and uh, he, you know, he wants people to be able to blow off some steam and maybe, you know, in, in the middle of a their introduction, uh, ta- a public introduction you know, is advising the new marshal not to uh, keep such a close watch on his, hmm. 
miners. Because well, he really However, wants them to work harder so they can make more money for the company, so they can do more amphetamine, so they can work harder, exactly. they can make more money for work the company, hard, blah, blah, play blah. Hard. But the, the amphetamine plot is, of course, uncovered later. Um, it's just, there's a few, the incidents happen too often, and uh, there are no autopsies on the people that die. Uh, they, they pretty much just space themselves, which mm-hmm. is goddamn it's creepy as hell, actually. Yeah. Especially, the one that, suspicious? Like, especially the one that goes into the elevator that just oh, yeah. like has the smile. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But anyway, uh, so these people are offing themselves. He uh, naturally, you know, it, and you know, the reasonable thing is, well, how often is this happening? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the doctor there, who's kind of just surly and uh, just whatever, notices the pattern right away. Probably should have been paying more attention to it in the first place, considering... <laughs> She established you know. that you know she's not very good at her job. She really is just there to make sure no one's you know to basically patch up minor wounds and make sure they don't catch syphilis from the hookers. But about fifty people had died over the past year. Um, but then I think it was before that only a couple have done that <laughs> over <laughs> the years before that. So it's like okay, we have a problem. And yes, they're taking this. Uh, experimental amphetamine uh, that uh, after taking it for too long it uh, fries your brain and you hallucinate and you you know hmm. wind up well, maybe I, I doing something like spacing yourself or taking a hooker hostage I, I or, think that's you know. probably pretty common with speed you tend to tends to fuck with your head after a while it's true they were bath salting I guess yeah remember when that was a big concern huh mm-hmm. and the whole, <laughs> yeah the real zombies and all that yeah. yeah, so he's on the case. Uh, it doesn't take him long to figure out that, well, pretty much everybody's in on it. Just about uh, police-wise, uh, the general manager, uh, even when he sings. Peter Boyle plays the general manager of the mind. Yeah, to explain those jokes. He looks weird <laughs> with a beard. I, like, I guess I've never <laughs> seen him with a beard before, but it just threw me off completely. Uh, I've seen some of his '70s work. Very, very interesting actor. I mean, not not including Young Frankenstein, mm. but you know, some of his uh, '70s work where he has these really, you know, complex characters. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's a brilliant but, actor. Uh, um, but yeah, it was just odd seeing him with a beard when I'm used to seeing. I guess I'm used to seeing him older. So yeah, yeah, he's still still pretty uh, pretty young here, mm. and. Um, well, so there's two criminals that are part of this ring, and, uh, well, uh, it's not really a spoiler alert. Sean Connery, of course, dispatches them mm-hmm. <laughs> in short order, and uh, then pretty much uh, they reveal their plans to each other in an odd way, That the fact that they revealed their plans to each other, mm-hmm. and... Uh, he said, you know, Peter Boyle's going to send for more men to, to take him out. Um, he has, they have this literal countdown clock of when these men are going to arrive hmm. uh, on the shuttle. And uh, it, they, he, of course, makes the proper Home Alone preparations, <laughs> uh, minus the Michael Jordan cutout. Uh-huh. And... Uh, and uh, they they cat and mouse each other, and I guess we could say hilarity ensues. <laughs> Incidentally, the marshal is played by Connery. I don't know if that was mentioned. Yes, um, I did a little bit. It kind of you know dropped in there that he dispatched him because yeah. he shot fucking Connery. Right, of course. Um, I love and the. You're opening... not going to have your two. Your first two shimps are not going to take out Sean no, Connery. Of course. Love the opening credits. It's just a star field with these electronic space sounds. With the names and just the t- the title of the movie fading in from behind, they just completely did away with the opening title. You know, traditional opening title sequence. I enjoyed that. Um, and then we get a bit of text on screen. I like that they phonetically spelled IO. <laughs> yes, I did too. I don't uh, know how I would have pronounced it if they hadn't done that. Uh... Well, I mean, I had heard of it before. It's a moon of Jupiter. You know, I was familiar with it. Right, but I, right. I appreciate that they did that. Incidentally, I'm noticing in my notes that I capitalize both letters every time, like input output. Oh, um, weird. Um, Love the trivia that he was originally going to name the movie IO, 
but mm-hmm. marketing people said everyone's gonna think it's ten. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we can name it IO. Loved the model of the station. I just it was a very nicely done, you know, very detailed model. You know, it, there's so much CG these days. It's just nice to see an old school model. Yeah, I, th- I think this was very new in some of the technology mm-hmm. uh, for filming, from what well, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I actually have some trivia. Uh, Outland was pioneering as the first mov- movie to use IntroVision, a variation of front projection that allows foreground, midground, and background elements to be combined in camera, as opposed to using optical processes such as blue screen matting. This enabled characters to convincingly walk around miniature sets of the mining colony. So yeah, it was ahead of its time in terms of you know some of some technology, but it's just nice to see old school practical effects and models, you know. Yeah, and for the most part, I think it works. I think there's some parts where you're like, ah, oh, you know, that's mm-hmm. not real. Right. But I think for the most part, you really do believe they're out there, mm-hmm. you know. And we also don't get any dialogue for the. No, there's no sound. No talking for the first five minutes then we get like a little bit of like calm chatter proper dialogue at 5 30 which is is right an unusual choice it's uh it's a very you know man with no name like i I forget one of those man with no name Mm. movies there's not a single word of dialogue for like the first 20 minutes i think well it is high (laughs) noon in space yes this was based on high noon in fact uh writer director peter hyam said I wanted to do a West- Western. Everybody said, you can't do a Western. Westerns are dead. Nobody will do a Western. I remember thinking that w- it was weird that this genre that had endured for so long was just gone. Then I woke up and came to me and came to the conclusion, obviously after other people, that, that it was actually alive and well, but in outer space. I wanted to make a film about the frontier, not the wonder and the glamour of it. I wanted to do something about Dodge City, how hard life was. I wrote it, and by great fortune, Sean Connery wanted to do it. And how many chances do you get to work with Sean Connery? So, <laughs> not only is it a western in space, it's specifically based on High Noon. I've never seen High Noon, so have you? I I don't think I have either. You know those Gary Cooper movies, but mm. uh, yeah, it's the the plot lines are very similar. It's odd because, like, regular westerns, I don't really get into. I think I probably mentioned this when we reviewed Silverado. I've seen very few of them. But I love space westerns. <laughs> yes. This, I, Firefly. I mean, anytime you put a western in space, I'm in, I'm in for it. And, of course, uh, I mean, the, orig- the OG space western is, of course, Star Trek. Well, yeah. Wagon, wa- wagon Train to the Wagon Stars. Train to the Stars, yeah. <laughs> I back to the movie. I'm glad we didn't get the perspective of Tarlo Ratzenberger's character when he freaked out because he was hallucinating about spiders. I actually spoiled a little bit of the movie for myself because I had to check IMDb or not IMDb Wikipedia to make sure that the you know there were there weren't actual giant spiders or something in the movie. <laughs> I'm morbidly arachnophobic for those who don't know. So yeah, I I, happen, I had to check that out and i saw it was actually you know a stimulant related hallucination i would have probably been a lot more into this as a kid if there were giant spiders Mm -hmm. (laughs) i I think i tried to watch this when i was young and it Mm -hmm. was just no (laughs) we both saw it as kids neither of us were into it because i think as you put it last week there were no jedi or aliens um yeah no creatures no jedis yeah no no phasers no spaceships you know it so That's it did... true. It was even fucking lasers. Mm. <laughs> using regular guns. Um, but when um, Tar- Tarlo, you know, pulled the hose on his suit, I liked the decompression effect. He, he explosively decompresses. That kind of thing doesn't act. Isn't actually what happens. It's more complicated. But I think that's what happens when you eat a wafer thin mint. Oh yeah. Um, but that's what that was reference was. Okay, I didn't get it when you were going through your perspective titles. <laughs> but yeah, it was a nice cheesy effect when he actually when you know he, he expanded and exploded. Um, some nice cheesy gore in the elevator when one of the you know when the second case of hallucination hallucination just gets in the elevator without an EV suit and goes down, and we don't see him explode, but we see the elevator open and he's laying there with his guts out. Yeah, 
like both of those deaths were just brutal. I mean, it's not that they were done terribly, but they were just terrible things to happen. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and you really, it wasn't like you care about them, even though you didn't know them. Mm. So it's it's interesting that they're they're drawing you in this way. Yeah, yeah. Other than that, like the exposition is like super slowly paced, yeah. which we're just not used to in film these days. And I love it. It took like forty too. minutes for the mystery to get uncovered. I do too. I I was really surprised. Like, you know, it's a sci-fi movie, but it's it's made for adults. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How weird! And they very subtly introduced the stimulant angle. Like, if I hadn't read a, read ahead, I don't know if I would have put it together before Connery said it. But I like that they gave us the opportunity. Yeah. Um, it's a good mystery in that sense. Um, one thing about Connery's character that did jump out at me, though, he does have a habit of casually threatening people. <laughs> he tells his son he'll, t- he'll lose some teeth if he doesn't eat his breakfast. Um, when he first meets the doctor, he very casually, very calmly, and he doesn't say these things angrily. He just says them very matter-of-factly. He says he, yes. he's going to beat her, throw, you know, throw her around the room if she doesn't comply with his orders. That's a you know, little little uh, martial humor, I think. She like says a doctor joke, ha, ha you know, uh-huh. and he's just like, yeah, I'm gonna fuck you up. Yeah. That's a martial joke. Very of its time. Um, I I did appreciate the holographic porn at the bar. I would like to drink there. <laughs> you get the people sitting at the bar, and at the corner of the bar, there are these hol- you know con- conical holographic projectors with people fucking in them. Yeah, yeah, it's it's that the take on the seventies or seventies Western saloon. Yeah, it was just go go dancers kind of taken to the next level, right? And you can easily see that happening. You know oh, yeah. that that that's how the future would be. Well, I mean, it depends on the bar. You know, if it's a little, if if it's a mining town, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, well, it's just like. The cam girl only it's going to be yeah. three dimensional right. and able to go you know work anywhere. Mm-hmm. But I'm saying having that on display in a bar, you're not going to get yeah. that you know at a lot of places. But if it's you know a little hole in the wall in a mining town where it's like you know where you have hookers openly you know working and you know it's ninety yeah. percent men, you're probably going to get that. Um, well, it's the Western Saloon though. I mean, it's I mean if you were watching. Yeah, exactly. um, What's it called? The the Western um, Dead, not Deadwood. Um, oh, um, the the theme park Western Flynn. Oh, uh, uh, Westworld. Westworld, yeah. Wow, uh, I can't believe I couldn't think of that name. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, it's like that where it's you know, well, then again, it is like Deadwood too because they had the saloons there. Uh-huh. Prostitution was definitely a part of it. Right. Oh yeah, that's a cliche. Um, yeah, but. I have to admit, this is probably my only criticism of the movie. Stakeout scenes just aren't as exciting when they involve security cameras. <laughs> as opposed to, you know, staking the person out in person. You know, you just have someone sitting behind a desk watching a camera. Just not as exciting. And he it comes to him very quickly, you mm. know, the whole ring. And just how obvious they are about it. Yeah. Like, he's given them no indication that they can just be that open with him but uh, is it just that they assume that he's going to you know play ball you know yeah because i guess the previous marshals were willing to like why (laughs) he hasn't given an indication in fact i think he even talks to uh seeking Mm -hmm. that uh james seeking um who was kind of seeking i don't know his dad (laughs) he's kind of his second in command And, and yeah he Makes a great foil for him, too, yeah. honestly. Kind of, you know, I wish he was in this for a little longer. Who knew that Dizzy <laughs> Hauser's dad was such a compelling actor? Yeah, I mean, I could have sworn this was the guy from uh, some of the Star Trek movies, but I guess it's a it, different guy. I, I know I've seen him in a billion other things. It's just Dizzy Hauser yeah. is the thing I go back to. Um, now, there is one element in the film that I wasn't sure I liked at first, but I, I do appreciate it. They don't portray um, O'Neill, Connery's character, as this big damn action hero who's invincible. He's right. a 50-year-old guy who's a bit out of shape, 
and you know a little pudgy and that's every action scene he has he's winded and you know can't yes. can just barely do what he needs to do he's he's you know they portray him as a middle-aged guy a lot of it is just adrenaline keeping him alive yeah because <laughs> connery i think was around 50 when the film was made yeah um, and and there's this foot chase in the middle of the movie, whereas him and another guy who's probably like in his forties, who's a bit out of shape, and it's at the time I didn't like it, but more I think the more I think about it, I like that they put such a realistic scene in a, a realistic action scene in a movie. Yeah, normally I'm not a fan of chase scenes because you you know how they're gonna right. end for the most part. But this one I liked. I mean, just yeah, just for that too, the mm-hmm. unusualness, the the non-athleticism yeah, of it yeah. and Although, maybe because we've just been seeing so many goddamn superhero movies where oh, everybody's yeah. just like right. super strong yeah i think that's part of why it's so appealing as well um although yeah. there was one part of that foot chase that kind of made me laugh um you know connery's chasing one of the the drug ring guys um he jumps over this lunch counter in this cafeteria not you know barges into a woman carrying a bunch of plates runs off she screams like he stabbed her. <laughs> Would have loved it if, if she was just like, what the fuck, man? But no, she screams like he stabbed her. <laughs> I loved the jail cells without atmosphere or gravity. Yeah, that's uh, that's tough. Mm. <laughs> Although when um, Sicking's character is killed... Um, they get very realistic. I wasn't okay with the enlarged, darkened tongue. Oh, man. Because <laughs> they really focus on that. A little too much. Um, I did like the neck guard. Apparently, people in this mining camp like the Garrett a lot. <laughs> I was not expecting the neck guard. I just thought, oh, that, oh, come on! How could he have survived that? And then oh, he takes that off, and it's like, oh, well, they, yeah, they well, lead I you to think to do it. They lead you to think that O'Neill was garroted to death about halfway through the movie. Obviously, he wasn't. You know, but you wonder how he's going to survive. He gets up and pulls that looks like a priest scholar, but it was, an, you know, a white guard around his neck to keep him from, you know, getting killed by a garret. Apparently, yeah, I don't think I ever thought he was dead i thought he but you know unconscious mm-hmm. or whatever and he'd oh, yeah. come back eventually mm-hmm. you were not expecting him to come back that quickly <laughs> well and i'm glad they did because obviously he wasn't dead and it's like okay how long are they gonna let us think that you know right. in, within seconds um but i just love that garroting was so common on this mining camp that he knew <laughs> to protect from that I also got a kick out of the virtual golf projector that um, Boyle's character uses. Right. I was thinking a lot about that, too. Um, the one flaw with that, of course, mm-hmm. the, the balls are going to bounce back. <laughs> well, no, those are actual machines that exist. My brother has one. Um, really? But this thing is this movie is set far enough in the future that we're mining IO. And... Yet, he's using a projector for his virtual golf game. Uh, I mean, it predates the holodeck, of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They don't have holodecks there, I guess. But, yeah, yeah. those those games exist. Um, you In more upscale ones, there is a tether on the ball, so it you know comes back. But, yeah. Oh. Uh, um, anyway. Um, I did also appreciate his wife's accent, because every time she said to their son... His name Polly. It sounded like she was saying poorly. <laughs> and yeah, the kid's dialogue was just too young. It was a kid, you know. Fortunately, they only gave him the one scene to be annoying and cute. Yeah, but gosh, Daddy. Mm-hmm. Hey, and you could see Connery was really tearing up after talking to him too. Mm-hmm. They really gave him a little. Uh, Seen to chew there. Mm-hmm. Connery was always kind of the same guy, but it worked. Yeah. Well, I think it's the point of the character. He's just this, you know, just the facts, ma'am. I don't care if this doesn't do well for my career. I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, yeah. But I'm saying Connery, as an actor, was very much a personality. You know, he wasn't a transformative oh, yeah. actor. <laughs> right. You know. He wasn't a Gene Hackman. He was just 
he was more of a Nicholson. He was he was the same guy in every role, but it worked. Huh. I mean, you can he there's different. I mean, this is definitely a different guy from you know Ramirez from the Highlander movie, who is you know a lot more flamboyant. Yeah, I guess. Um, but this was James Bond, pretty much, and yeah. <laughs> without the gadgets. Mm. Um, the final confrontation when you know the, he's waiting for the ship for the shuttle to land when the when the hitman coming after him it did lack a bit of suspense. I thought. I, know, I well, mean, they, they just could have done something. Maybe maybe it was a music cue that was missing or something. It just could have been a bit more intense for me. They really did milk like twenty minutes of, you know, he's you know who's with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to prepare the traps, uh, the impending doom. Oh, he's got a family, you know, talking to them, kind of just the the stakes. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know if that needed 20 minutes. <laughs> Did like the jump scare when the doctor, the doctor, come, you know, finds him in the middle of this cat and mouse game with these assassins, with these hitmen to kind of bandage his shoulder after he got shot. And she volunteers to help him, you know, by misdirecting a few of the, the assassins. Um, now, the whole thing also, when that whole long sequence was done, why was he out of place? Like, he had to, like, run to get yeah. to, like, where he needed to be. And it was like, dude, there was literally a countdown yeah. <laughs> that was telling you when they were going to be there. <laughs> like, dude, I almost forgot. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like the part where she's running up these stairs and comes face to face with what you think is one of the guards. It's just a uniform. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed that. Um, the whole thing with her sneaking around the station was very suspenseful. I, I, yes. I, you know, they, they knew how to work that, just not the scene before. And um, I really didn't understand what his plan was. With the uh, your access way five to funnel him there, I, yeah, mm-hmm. I didn't. I saw him tinkering with that access way. You know, he was doing stuff. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I, until like just before he did it, mm-hmm. I, I was not entirely sure what the plan was, and I was right. like, oh, <laughs> well, that's clever. <laughs> yeah, also very clever, throwing the uh, piece of metal off the roof of the greenhouse to get one of the the other one to shoot the hole in the door in the wall. Oh. That that guy was a dumb fuck, though. Come <laughs> on. <laughs> like, really? I mean, is you know, 70 Sam after him? <laughs> I, I just gotta... It, it was very Home Alone now that you mentioned that. But, yeah, I, I did appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd have appreciated an iron to the head, to the face. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, yeah, the, the, the access way one I thought was brilliant. It was mm. just like, holy shit. The, the other guy was just... Yeah. Oh, is that something moving? <laughs> <laughs> Shoot it. I'm like, you're an idiot, man. <laughs> also enjoyed the awkward last scene between um, O'Neill and Lazarus, Connor and the doctor. <laughs> They're saying goodbye. You know, he's, he's on his way to go meet up with his family. She's staying there. And it was just this really awkward, like, okay, yeah, see you later. Thanks. <laughs> kind of scene. Yeah. We ain't ever seen each other again. Yeah. Or but what it, is it like Cartman said to the Ethiopians as he was leaving the planet? Yeah, yeah, and Jesse Jackson might be present. <laughs> Dude! It, it just goes to one of the things I really like about the movie. There is nothing slick about it. No, no, there isn't. They they are gleefully, you know, not, you know, slick and mm-hmm. curmudgeonly and just fuck this shit. Yeah. Or, I, I love it. Literally, the the climax was just fuck it. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, I was expecting this elaborate. You are under arrest for the charges of blah mm-hmm. blah blah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Just, <laughs> just before, after he takes out the hitman, he goes to the bar and just to see Boyle's character, the GM, and he's about to try to arrest him, and Boyle is kind of trying to talk him down, and you know. And they say, yeah, just fuck it, and belts him. <laughs> well, the other thing is, of course, he knew that uh, wh- whoever was supplying those drugs mm-hmm. were going to kill him anyway. So right, he really right. didn't need to do anything yeah. to him. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, the assumption is, yeah, he's going to be killed by the company anyway. So, 
you just you get just, a little aggression out by belting him, get a little payback there. And yeah, who needs to arrest the guy? You know, mm -hmm. he's gonna get taken care of. Yeah. I'm out of here anyway. <laughs> and then we just get a nice capper at the end where, you know, his wife who had left because she didn't want her son raised on Io, you know, in a mining colony, you know, goes back to Earth where he can, you know, she can raise him well. And he manages to catch up with them in time to go back to Earth with them. So it ends via, via text message, if you will. Effectively, yeah. Yeah. Sequels and remakes? Sequels and remakes. On August 18th, 2009, Warner Brothers announced that director Michael Davis had been hired to direct a remake of the film from a script by Chad St. John. That sounds so much like a port name. <laughs> <laughs> no casting or start date information was announced. Um, so that was over a decade ago. I'm going to guess it's not happening. Um, What's the point of remaking pretty much a remake, a remake of High yeah. Noon? Right. A comic strip adaptation of Outland, illustrated by Jim uh, Steranko, appeared in Heavy Metal Magazine in July of 81 um, to October of 81 and January 82 issues. Well, three issues, July, October, and January 82. Um, I would love to check those out. I mean, you can't do a TV series of it because, I mean, you'd pretty much be doing Deep Space Nine. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's It's... It's a one and done. Leave it alone. It is, you know, it's of its time. It's and very right, a sequel wouldn't make any sense because he's retiring. Yeah, no. And it's not like they're, and it's not like this was a decorated officer that no. they'd like. We got to call this guy out of retirement. No, he was kind of a fuck up. You yeah, know, yeah. he was. They they mentioned that he's handed the shit assignments because he was too honest in his last assignments. Yeah, love that. He doesn't make friends. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. And finally, a song based on Outland called High Moon, which I had come up with as for a title, come up with as a title for this episode before I saw this bit of trivia, was written by Star, was performed by Star One, a side project of Arian composer Arian Lucasen for the Space Metal album. Um, oh, yeah, that was, I actually had the same bit of trivia twice in here for the uh, remake. <laughs> Got slightly oh. confused by that. Under Brains? On the brains. I really liked it. I'm going four and a half. I enjoyed the fuck out of it. It's got its warts and the pacing mm -hmm. slows, but I definitely recommend it. Four brains. All right. And what have we learned? Uh, we learned that the zero grab really does add about 10 pounds to you. <laughs> and I learned that grownups have no sense of humor. That's it for Outland. Until next time, we'll be reviewing Runaway. Um, assuming nobody important dies before then. <laughs> don't, don't even, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> of course, until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are.